latente en el aire y la tierra, de los pueblos la lucha final. This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. And we have been covering the issue of the AFL-CIO international relations, what they're doing internationally. And that is important. Most workers in the United States are unaware of the role of the AFL-CIO internationally. And the fact that Solidarity Center, which is part of the AFL-CIO, gets $75 million from the National Endowment for Democracy. And before that formation of the Solidarity Center, there was a an organization called the AIFLD, American Institute of Free Labor Development, which operated in Latin America, particularly in El Salvador. And joining us uh, today is Frank Hammer. He's a retired UAW uh, activist, militant, president of his local, uh, GM local. And he has a story about his brother was uh, working for the AIFLD. So welcome to Workweek, Frank. I, I think I learned about AFL. Uh, in the very early 60s, uh, around the time of, of its formation, I think it was formed around uh, 1962. And it was already by 1964 that my brother was working at a field, uh, first as a clerk, and then he became a, a country program director, and then later on, even further up the chain. Um, and AFIELD was, you know, and I began to learn about it, AFIELD was uh, conceived around the same time that John Kennedy um, was about creating the Alliance for Progress, which is a very, you know, happy sounding uh, phraseology, but really it was, uh, the phraseology was intended to cover how do we counter Cuban revolutions in Latin America? So it was a multi-pronged, really uh, well-endowed program as really as a counterinsurgency in Latin America should any of the uh, workers and campesinos and the peoples of Latin America be inspired by the Cuban revolution and should they be able, should they want to navigate those waters, the U.S. had a response and it was called Alliance for Progress. So, and my brother, he had gone to the Air Force after high school, and he had the aspirations of being, uh, working in foreign service. And uh, after the Air Force, he had gone to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and it was there that he made connections with the newly formed A-Field, and that's where he got hired from. So he was, his aspiration had nothing to do with trade unions or labor movement. It was all about he wanted to be uh, in foreign service. And so how did he end up in El Salvador? So AFIL had a program in every country in Latin America, and he served in quite a few. He was in Brazil. He was in Colombia. He was in Venezuela. He was in Honduras and in El Salvador and in Brazil, if I didn't say it before. Um, so he was actually uh, involved in various uh, labor movements in the various countries, but he also, when he was in El Salvador, uh, actually opened up the first agrarian program in El Salvador and uh, ultimately eventually became the director of the uh, land reform movement for all of AFIELD, for all of Latin America, but he he uh, cut his teeth in, in El Salvador and served there many years and uh, was very uh, attached to El Salvador in his work. Uh, but uh, it was, as I said, uh, part of a counterinsurgency effort. And that's, anyway, that's what he was doing. Was so very, this, was a, this was an operation that the AFL-CIO was involved in. Why would the AFL-CIO be involved in this operation with the U.S. government? The, uh, the AFL-CIO pretty much adopted the goals of the U.S. government in Latin America. Uh, it was an ideological uh, underpinning, certainly to begin with, to be sure. Um, the idea was if we made imperialism richer, that the uh, you know the home workers would be uh, thereby enriched uh, from the super profits of the companies, and of course in the process 
so would the labor bureaucracy by receiving all this money from the US government. First, it was quite blatant and also money received from corporations. And then when people realized that AFL-CIO was really the AFL-CIA, they, did, uh, they couldn't uh, so directly fund their operations uh, for a field and they went to what appeared to be a private foundation, the National Endowment for Democracy, but National Endowment for Democracy gets all its money from the US government. So it's been uh, government funded and uh, it's been you know under various names. And like I said, now it goes under this cover of the National Endowment for Democracy. And the National Endowment for Democracy is an organization of the uh, Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Chamber of Commerce, and the AFL-CIO. In El Salvador, there has been a history of massacres of trade unionists, farmers, 30,000 workers were killed in a massacre in El Salvador. What happened to your brother in, in El Salvador? I'm glad you referred to in the 30s. It was actually a massacre of basically countries and people in the countryside, peasantry. And it was a slaughter of 30,000 in response to an uprising in El Salvador, uh, very brutal. And so in the 70s, there was a, a huge uh, movement behind the, uh, uh, the, the liberation organization, the FML, and, and uh, there was a very active uh, peasants movement and my brother's role there was to form a peasant union uh, under the uh, rubric or under the control of a, of a field. Um, and it was done in the banner of land reform and it was a way of splitting the peasant uh, movement and fun funneling funds from the US government through a field two various organizations in El Salvador. And it was their way of making the peasant movement friendly to the US because it was becoming reliant on the US funding for its operation. So it was uh, developing a dependency. And along with that, at the same time, there were also military preparedness going on in El Salvador through the, military, the US military, through the Green Berets, uh, and others that were also working in the countryside as military goon squads and death squads. So you had both operations going on simultaneously. And uh, your brother was killed. He was a victim yeah. of a massacre by these uh, government police forces, gangsters in, in El Salvador. What was their explanation? Because you tried to yourself find out what happened to your brother. My brother was uh, assassinated along with two other men in January 3rd, uh, in 1980. My brother had by then not, no longer been the country program director. He had actually returned to uh, Washington, D.C. He was in the national office overseeing the land reform program for all of Latin America and was called for an emergency meeting with the Campesino, who had since uh, become actually the Salvadoran government's director of agrarian reforms. And he uh, uh, requested a meeting with my brother and another official of AFIELD. The two went to, uh, uh, to El San Salvador to the hotel where Afield was headquartered, which was the Sheraton Hotel, and had this emergency meeting. And at the very same time that, he, that, that this meeting is taking place in the cafeteria, the, some of the um, uh, um, large landowners who had ownership, partial ownership of the Sheratons were having a big party. And when these three men were witnessed walking through the uh, lobby and going to the cafeteria, the, uh, these right-wing reactionary um, landowners and businessmen uh, went out to the guardsmen that were protecting the Sheraton and instructed them and gave them silencers and instructed them to go into the cafeteria and slaughtered, uh, slaughtered the three men uh, with like 40 rounds of um, machine gun fire. So they were victims of the reactionaries in El Salvador, which is always very, very confusing because um, you know you think the original explanation that was offered by the right uh, was that it was the communists that had done this. And of course, the, that, was, uh, it was not, that was not the case. And then uh, Afield had another explanation and said, well, if it wasn't for the communists, my brother would not have been killed. 
but the reality and the truth is that the reactionaries did not even appreciate the minimal reform that Afield was bringing to some of the better off peasant, union, peasant uh, uh, farmers and did not uh, believe in the idea that you could just give an inch to keep a lot, that you give, if you gave an inch, you're gonna have to give more. So that's part of what explains why they were assassinated. And you made an effort to get information and were able to get the, uh, into the uh, archives of the Meany Institute. What was that all about? Why is the AFL-CIO leadership, including the present leadership, keeping these files secret uh, about their international operations? And what effort did you have to go through to get to see these actual files? So I think that uh, generally speaking, um, you know, my brothers and sisters, for example, in the UAW or just in US labor generally uh, are not, uh, you know, let's put it this way. They don't get daily reports on the activities of Afield back then or of Solidarity Center now, although certainly back then it was very uh, secretive uh, because the workers I think really knew the role of their federation in Latin, you know, Central Latin America, uh, they would they would be a, they would be shocked and they would be uh, adamant about we're not supporting the right side. We should be supporting the workers and the peasants, not the uh, big landowners, not the U.S. corporations. So those files uh, contain a lot of information about those relationships, and I because I was my brother's brother. Uh, was actually afforded access where others had not been. And that was uh, during the time period where the files were stored at the George Meany Labor College in, uh, in uh, just outside Washington, D.C. So I had uh, access, and as a result, I've been able to compile information that's quite detailed and it's quite, uh, in some cases, really eye-opening in terms of really understanding some of the documents that were, were being exchanged between the Washington office uh, at Bayfield, the US embassy and so on, and all the correspondence and what kind of relationship those items illustrate about the, uh, the relationship between Afield, the AFL, CIO, the US corporations, the government. And one of the things that you discovered was that Histadruth, the Israeli Trade Union Federation was also involved in the international operations with the AFL, CIO. What was the Histadruth doing? in uh, these countries? The AFL relied on Hishabut, which is the labor federation, so-called, in Israel. But it's actually, uh, it's actually a, a very reactionary, pro-government, pro-business formation in Israel that was instrumental in the Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands. So its whole mindset and, and operation is an imperialist one uh, and, and a colonizing one. And that's quite what the role was of the U.S. and Afield and El Salvador. So they, were, they looked to Hezredu to find out, well, how do you do it? What do we need to do? And my brother uh, frequently was a guest at Hezredu uh, operations in Israel to learn uh, how they went about keeping down the Palestinians and colonizing their people. The other thing I should mention is that the whole model was based on the US operations during the Vietnam War, which was called Operation Phoenix. It was to uh, murder the, the uh, peasants and the rebellion peasants in the countryside, the ones that were part of the National Liberation Front, at the same time offering land reform to uh, entities within the peasant movement that were uh, approachable. So they really uh, created, so the incredible division in the ranks of the resistance, and that was their role in El Salvador as well. That's what it was modeled on. And Liz Schuler, the new president of the AFL-CIO, many of the top officials of the AFL-CIO have been involved in these operations, uh, the Solidarity Center. How can it be that the AFL-CIO is getting $75 million for the Solidarity Center, and workers in the United States have no idea that this large amount of money from the government is going for purposes which they may not be in agreement with around the world. Again, uh, I mean, it's a hallmark of union bureaucracies and certainly the AFL-CIO to decide that, you know, they're the union. Uh, they're the only people that need to know. And by the way, if you begin to tell people 
all these things, you know, you're going to have to answer more questions that you don't want to have to answer. So I do want to say that, um, you know, A-Field, uh, because of all the controversy generated about A-Field, and I should mention El, El Salvador is just about one, Chile is another, the, the overthrow of the government in 1973 was unlikely to have been successful without the role, the active role of A-Field. Sounds like the, the AFL-CIO actually has blood on its hands because it's led to the murder and terrorism against workers uh, all over the world where they've operated. I mean, if Israeli uh, history is involved in giving out arms, I know that in Brazil, there were uh, the military coup in Brazil was supported by the AFL-CIO. It sounds like there's an accounting to be held for officials and the AFL-CIO leadership for actually harming, killing, and murdering trade units around the world. Is that true? Absolutely, uh, there is an accounting. And just to finish the thought that I had earlier, so AFL was disbanded under the presidency of John Sweeney, and uh, who was really the first elected AFL-CIO uh, official uh, president. And but once, but when they dismissed AFL and two other organizations operating in Asia and Africa, uh, they 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 recreated uh, a sequel called the Solidarity Center. And they obviously did it with a lot more intelligence and, and, and uh, a more clever uh, rendition of what you, I feel used to be. And uh, it can advertise that it's helping uh, various struggles around the world with that money that they get from the US government via the NAD, but it also performs some very sinister uh, operations, including the attempted overthrow of the Chavez government in Venezuela in 2002, and that wasn't a field that was under the name of the Solidarity Center. So it has this two-sided character that on the one hand, it can advertise that it's helping out workers in, let's say, Papua New Guinea, but on the other hand, it's playing this nefarious role of maintaining capitalist power in these various countries. Do you think the unions in the United States should be getting money for the U.S. government for international operations? The labor movement Professors, the AFIL professed, their professed role was to build independent unions, if you can imagine that, funded by the U.S. government. Uh, but the, the point is that we need independent uh, trade unions, free of government encumbrances, because it really ultimately is a workers' organization, and it is the workers that have to support the activity of the union, not the government. The government obviously is going to do it, with certain intentions in mind, and it's not necessarily for the benefit of the workers. And there's a struggle now in the UAW, uh, just a victory for the direct election uh, of the national officers of the, uh, the UAW. You think that this issue of the UAW and other CWA, uh, other unions, UFCW, this issue of the international operations and uh, whether or not the AFL should be taking money from the U.S. government, and, and they all, whether or not they should open their books to their actual records, should be an issue uh, in the trade union movement. I, uh, when I was making the arrangements, and I, I forget her name, she was uh, uh, the head of uh, I forget in the AFL CIO that I was dealing with. You know, I said, you know, you ought not be receiving money and accepting money from an NED, and she, of course, responded saying, well. We otherwise wouldn't have the resources to do the wonderful work that we do. Uh, they, there has to be a reckoning of breaking from uh, funding through corporations and the government in anything that the union, the federation does. And this would re represent a, an incredible change uh, in, the, in the federation and in who's, who, who are, is going to hold the AFL-CIO accountable. To, the unions that are part of it or the government. And in regards to the UAW, I mean, I think that um, the UAW uh, should join the when, when we have new leadership in a campaign to release the, a, all the documents about AFIL so that we can have a reckoning with the uh, trade union's role in the past as a way of charting what our forward role should be in really building uh, working class uh, solidarity uh, universally and across the world. So it's a, it's a huge reckoning. Uh, 
but we won't achieve uh, a lot without it. We have to do it, both in terms of the interests of workers and in the interests of the, of the planet, by the way. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with Frank Hammer, uh, retired UAW uh, local union president, activist, and uh, whose brother was uh, killed, murdered. He was an AIFLD agent, along with another AIFLD official in El Salvador, and his struggle to find out what happened to his brother and the role of the AFL-CIO in El Salvador and internationally. So thanks for joining us on Workweek. Steve, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.